Hi everyone, welcome to the lecture 8 of hardware software co-design for HGI and in today's lecture we'll be discussing about FPGAs, Zinc and Zinc MPSOC. So this is like a shift in trend of what we have been discussing in the past. In the first six lectures we've discussed about Edge AI and in, the, in lecture 7 we discussed about GPU programming. And now we are going to dive into the core concept of hardware software core design and FPGAs is what actually enables hardware software core designing. I'll be following a reference book called Zinc MP SOC and you can follow that as well. I'm taking directly from that book. So let's first of all begin understanding the Zinc MP SOC. So the Zinc MP SOC is an evolution of the Zinc 7000 SOC or simply which was called as Zinc. So it was one of its kind, one of the first SOCs released by Xilinx. And both of these devices uh, comprise of a processing system. So we're going to use this word very often. PS refers to processing system and PL refers to programmable logic. The PL being equivalent of the field programmable gate array FPGA as you know about it, which you've studied in some courses on reconfigurable computing, etc. So as depicted in the figure, which you can see that there's a comparison of these devices at high level and the PS in the Zinc MPSOC is larger and more sophisticated than in Zinc. So this is just the programmable logic which is there in your FPGA, which you code using your Verilog. And then in Zinc, they introduced a processing system, which was a dual core ARM Cortex processor, as we'll see in further slides which ran all of your software based things and the programmable logic helped in parallelization of the tasks. So this was uh, and uh, in Zinc MPSOC which is a more advanced it's evolved version of Zinc we have a bigger processing system with much more components and because that's what the industry actually accepted. So in this uh, chapter, in this video, the characteristics of these three devices will be reviewed and the similarities and differences between them highlighted. All right. So this is a simplified architecture of Zim Zinc RF SOC, which is again based on MPSOC only with which is having radio frequency capabilities. And you can see that the processing system looks uh, very similar, but in programmable logic, there are certain hardened IPs. We'll go through the discussion of what hardened IPs really mean, but putting it right now is that in the programmable logic, if you create any particular sub block or IP, instead of you are creating it using configuration logical blocks, CLBs as you call it, configuration logic blocks, instead of creating it using the programmable logic as a, as a general purpose thing, you just harden it. You, you, actually fabricate it and uh, you make it into the silicon. So with hardened IPs, what you actually optimize is your silicon area. Because if you try to make the same things which you are seeing all of here can be made using uh, the general purpose configuration logic blocks, but they are certain, certain times hardened into the whole system. This is a hardware software partitioning approach that how the actual MPSOC is coming into the play. So most of the things we'll understand deeply in the coming lectures as well, but to give you a high level overview, so you can see here is the processing system and here is the programmable logic. So if there is a module, which is a low computation task, you actually assign it to a core on the, uh, in the processing system into the application processing unit, APU. If there is uh, some operating system which you are running, then you again, you can run it on a single core of your uh, application processing unit. If there is a real time task, so imagine this FPGA is powering, let's say, an ADAS or a autonomous car. ADAS is advanced uh, driver assistance system. Then, if there is a real time task, let's say, of obstacle avoidance or collision prevention, something like that, or maybe airbag inflation, then that you put it on a real time processing unit which is having two cores. So this is an R5 ARM processor and this really corresponds well with the deadlines and the timelines. Then if there is a module which uh, in which the task can be paralyzed, you try to put it into programmable logic. 
and if there is a task let's say with a time sensitive data you again put it on the programmable logic then vcu stands for video codec unit if there is a multimedia task which is related to encoding and decoding of videos and processing on it you utilize a vcu which is a hardened ip again and uh, if there is a task that processes a stream of continuous data you try to put it on programmable logic and finally there is a space which is graphics process gpu uh, in which you put a multimedia task so this is how you try to partition whatever application you're building your hardware software code design on you try to partition it eff effectively using the available resources which you have so that's why we are discussing here that how how fpga and how mpsoc is actually enabling hardware software partition so let's go through the technology timeline because it's important to understand the history and come to this uh, time when like we're discussing this technology so in around 1985 the first fpgas were made and there is this xilinx chip which we'll uh, look i'm forgetting the name of it which was manufactured a very small ic a very small fabrication which signified the utilization of reconfigurable part of fpga then in around 2012 so the fpga size grew and more and more things could be burned into the fpga but in around 2011 2012 time frame zinc socs came into the market so it was conceived in 2009 2010 took around one or two years to develop the mixture of processing capabilities of a ps and the programmable logic the acceleration capabilities of a programmable logic and they fabricated it together into zinc M zinc soc and then a more evolved version because the industry was accepting this product so widely and so much that they put an evolved version of uh, zinc which they called as zinc mp soc and in 2021 they released an even newer version of zinc mp soc which they call as everest or sorry versal series which stands for a cap devices um we'll discuss about this sometime later you can go over to the website and watch it so since zinc 7000 the fpg which we are going to use in all our course and practical thing is kriya kv260 board which is built on zinc ultra scale or the zinc mpsoc architecture but we have to understand where it all began and zinc 7000 soc is the starting point of it so we'll first of all understand the zinc 7000 soc and it was first released in around 2011 so what are the zinc architectures and features which we are going to understand so to provide a high level overview of the architecture the zinc architecture has two parts the ps and the pl and with a set of interconnections between them you can see here the programmable logic the processing system and the set of interconnections between them these interconnections are based on the advanced extensible interface exi standard so exi standard is an industry standard on chip communication protocol and it is developed by arm we'll have a discussion on this i think two or three lectures maybe next lecture itself about exi protocol and how it has become the industry standard so the rationale for coupling a processing system ps with pl is to provide this is a very important thing for you to understand to provide a dedicated optimized resource for running the software based components of an embedded system so any embedded system has certain software based components to it which uh, there are two types of computing the spatial computing and the temporal computing so fpga primarily the pl side of it supports the spatial computing and the ps side supports the temporal computing the spatial computing refers to the parallel execution of multiple operations simultaneously across an array of hardware resources and this is the hallmark feature of fpgas where computations are mapped onto spatial array of logic gates allowing for high pa highly parallel data processing on the other hand a temporal computing involves sequential executions where tasks are processed one after the other over time and this approach is common in cpus where a limited number of processing cores handle instructions sequentially and they allow the branching of statements etc and besides having the ps there is definitely the availability of uh, doing great parallelism and reconfigurability in the field itself 
and that is possible through the PL. So this is the rationale for coupling the PS and the PL. So the AXI interfaces form the connection between the two sections and AXI is a standard that is optimized for all your SOC applications. The relative size of the PS and the PL which you see is not drawn to the scale obviously and uh, there are several devices in the zinc range each, is, each one broadly is having the same processing system PS inside but there is a different levels of PL and based on the application which you are trying to deploy it for you choose appropriate device. So the zinc processing system we'll have a discussion about the first uh, just like you know very quick highlight because I know many of you are actually first of uh, first time getting introduced to this so we'll keep the discussion on very highlight level and then later on we'll dive a little bit deeper into each of these aspects so firstly we'll understand the zinc processing system or as we call it properly the PS so this PS which is indicated by the blue section comprises of an application grade processor along with other components. So the application grade processor which we call as the APU application processor unit includes a dual core ARM Cortex A9 processor and this is true for again remember Zinc 7000 series. The one which we are going to discuss later on will be Zinc MPSoc and it has a different set of processors. So and along with this processor there is a 256 KB of on-chip cache memory for highly efficient uh, like it's on chip memory this memory is available on chip so it's very quick to access in one clock cycle or in two clock cycles you can access the whole memory along with the APU you have interconnects and memory interfaces so these enable communication between the PS and PL the interconnects and with external memories respectively so if there is a DDR4 RAM outside so you can actually store data in that as well it can be of let's say 128 MB 512 MB depending on its size but it requires much more access time and much more energy is also spent to access external memory then there are set of IO peripherals inside the PS so IO peripherals will be available in programmable logic and processing system to uh, as well like because both support input output so but there are certain uh, set of IO peripherals specific to the processing system and uh, these include USB, UART, SPI, I2C. So the PS in the Zinc has two processing cores which gives the designer the option to use both cores for the same operating system or to use a different operating system on each and it's completely in your control that what operating system you want to run on which core and the interface which Xilinx people provide or for that matter any FPGA manufacturer like Intel they, they give the complete customization of option to the developers and uh, later on we'll compare the Zinc PS with the PS of the Zinc MPSoc architecture and uh, note the expansion of functionality in the new device in particular we'll see that Zinc MPSoc has up to six processing cores four will be APU and two will be RPU as we had seen earlier and there is this lightweight version of Zinc called Zinc uh, 7000S which is just having a single ARM Cortex A9 processor. Now let's discuss about the Zinc program, the logic overview highlights. So the PL part of the Zinc is based, so you might have, if in your undergraduate work on FPGA, you might have heard of RTX 7 or Kintex 7 or Vertex 7. So RTX 7 is the FPGA fabric, so this is 7, because it's 7 series. So this is the FPGA fabric. Now we are talking particularly about PL. So the whole device in itself is called Zinc 7000 and inside that the FPGA fabric, the PL part is either called RTX 7, Kintex 7 or Vertex 7 depending on the technology which is used. So the RTX 7 is for the smaller devices and uh, Kintex 7 is for the larger ones. And there is a very high performance Vertex 7 also which is available which is I think based on FinFET technology. So like the equivalent FPGAs, Zinc PL includes the DSP48X here simply refers to generic thing because there are many variations of DSP48 slices. So in the older version we had the DSP48E1 and uh, what what is DSP that is what you have to understand. So this is a resource for high speed arithmetic operations. There are availabilities in the FPGA PL, there are availability of the block RAM which is popularly called as DRAM. So there are multiple high speed transceivers available to communicate within and outside the system. 
and there are integrated communication blocks as well as the general purpose logic which is most commonly used whenever you write a Verilog code. So the interface between the PS and the PL, there are nine interfaces between the two regions. We'll delve into the nine interfaces independently. Do not worry about it right now. We're, this is just an overview of the uh, of the whole architecture. So four of the interconnections are designated as general purpose and four as high performance. And the remaining interconnection is the accelerator coherency port ACP, called as popularly as ACP which provides a direct route between the APU and the PL. So this accelerator coherency port is directly linked with APU and the PL. So the zinc devices which are available currently, so to provide a brief comparison of the devices in this family, we'll look at this table and uh, the PS is as I told you initially is identical in all of these majority of these chips the only difference between the maximum supported clock frequency and the PL is also similar across the range with the lower end devices as we discussed having the RTX 7 based logic and the remainder adopting the Kintec 7. The PL dimensions and number of specialist resources such as DSP slices, block RAMs and input output also vary depending on so this table we'll zoom in into and you can see that the dual core ARM Cortex A9 processor and this Neon and FPU extensions are available in all. So Neon technology is particularly uh, designed for high performance multimedia processing and it includes video encoding, recording, audio processing and this is uh, like the ARM processors uh, single instruction multiple data. SIMD instructions in ARM processors. So it enables that same operation can be performed on multiple data points simultaneously. And this is particularly useful for tasks like digital signal processing or machine learning AI where large data sets need to be processed in parallel. So just to walk you through that uh, the different the different family names, Zinc, all of them begin with Zinc 7 because this is the 7000 series. So 7010, 7015, 7020303545, All of them are increasing order of uh, like resources. You can see that the number of flip flops in the lower model is around 35,000 and it increases by around almost 10 to 12 times in the higher model the max processor clock frequency is 866 megahertz in this and in this family it goes up to 1 gigahertz and in this it is around 800 megahertz you can see the total number of LUTs which are there so you will uh, we'll discuss about what LUTs are what logic cells block trams are as of now we're just making a comparison of, to understand that within the same family you have multiple FPGAs uh, uh, device, FPGA devices, Zing devices possible and you need to choose one which is appropriate for your application. So the number of 36 KB block RAMs it's mentioned, the number of DSP 48 even slices that is also mentioned here. So let's turn on the use models, use cases of uh, Zing. And uh, as to begin with, designers may adopt Zing having previously used FPGAs or having worked with processors or both. So whoever has worked with just the FPGA or with just processors, Zinc is for them. And at its time of introduction, the selling point of Zinc was to offer a solution for implementing uh, processor based tasks such as running software and an operating system and FPGA based uh, processing on a single device with high end performance and high capacity interconnection between the two components. And this was not at all available at, in the market at that time. So if previously only an FPGA would have been used, then adding a dedicated hard processor, that's, this is an important thing, hard processor offered increased performance compared to a soft processor constructed from general purpose PL resources. So previously also in FPGA, people used to make a processor. It wasn't that processing capabilities or software was not possible, but they used to create a soft processor. Soft processor means that using the general purpose PL resources, you create a processor inside it and then it has its own instruction set architecture, it has its own bit uh, number of how many bits uh, instructions it takes. It's fully customizable how many registers it has inside it, just like any other processor. 
but point was that it used a huge deal of uh, huge deal of resources of pl and most of the pl resources were used in making the processor itself and could not have been used for other acceleration of tasks so it made sense that optimize this area for actually putting a hardened processor and what is a better processor to include other than the arm processors So, uh, if previously processor was used in isolation, the presence of FPG logic enabled certain tasks to be implemented in hardware, providing acceleration and freeing up processor for other tasks. Systems that previously required both a dedicated processor and FPGA could be reduced from two physical devices to just one with the associated saving in interfacing effort, power consumption, bill of material cost, and etc. And these considerations are further discussed uh, specifically for the Zinc 7000 in their old book. However, we find that similar factors motivate the use of the Zinc MPSOC. As described over the coming pages, the Zinc MPSOC provide further integrations of processing elements, expanding the PS part of the Zinc to include real-time processing engine, graphic processor and video codec, along with more capable applications. So remember this uh, slide which we looked at. So this slide is actually capturing the essence of the use cases of MPSOC Zinc in general. All right. So now let's come to the uh, architecture which we are actually interested in studying throughout this course, which is Xilinx Zinc MPSOC, which got released in around 2015, four years after the initial announcement of Zinc. And it's just an extension and expansion of the architecture compared to the Zinc. Having the same high level elements, a PS side, a PL side and an EXI interconnect, a high speed EXI interconnect to enable the communication between the two. The Zinc MPSOC uh, offers a enhanced PS along with larger PL and obviously a different number sizes are available as is the case was as was the case with Zinc 7000 and the Zinc ZIMP families have been established within the MPSOC range to cater for different type of applications. So these families are distinguished by two later designation, either CG, like there is a first designation and the second, first one identifying the processor system identifier and the second one identifying the engine type. So it can be CG, EG or EV devices like C stands for dual APU, dual RPU, E stands for quad APU, dual RPU and a single GPU. So up to six cores. Uh, along six cores you can see here along with another GPU which you have and the G and E refers to the general purpose or particularly meant for uh, the video EV devices because as we had seen there was a VCU video codec unit so all those application areas where you def need like video encoding decoding compressing and compressing all the times so doing some processing on that you would want to go with certain like an EV device. So Zinc MPSOC does not replace the Zinc, till now also the Zinc 7000 is there in the market but rather it offers an expanded and enhanced solution for similar form. So if your application is very small then why would you need an overkill for that? But if your application is like making a 360 degree camera or uh, making like a 360 degree coverage of a football match then you need advanced processing capabilities and you need an FPGA and we'll discuss some of the uh, things like the flying of a drone in one of the coming lectures where we'll see that the need of higher processing capabilities which Zinc MPSOC can provide us. So let's look at the MPSOC architecture and features and um, you can read this on your own it's from the book itself I'll just highlight few of the important points. So architecture is its uh, one of the one of the important aspects as we had seen already that definitely provides a much better PS and uh, the PL capabilities than the previous versions but along with that there are certain architectural changes one of which being its power management capabilities. So this device all the devices in this Zinc MPSOC are partitioned into four separate power domains which can be operated individually. More discussion on this I am seeing it again and again as we are we will progress through the lectures and course more discussion will happen on each of these aspects and uh, which can be operated individually so which naturally means a new part of the device can be powered down when they are not required which improves overall power efficiency 
Additionally, uh, the ultra scale plus architecture, which is there in the FPL part, the ultra scale plus architecture. Uh, so it is much better and improved version over the 7 series architecture like the Vertex 7, Artex 7, Kintex 7 which we saw. So uh, two particularly notable differentiating features are the inclusion of ultra RAMs. So along with the BRAM which is block RAMs and the distributed RAMs in this particular Zinc MP SOC we have the inclusion of ultra RAMs which are very fast memory access time and a huge bulk of memory can be read read and write to be written at once. So and along with the DSP modification the DSP slices so devices with several different sizes of PL exist and the smallest and the, the largest ones are highlighted in this table so you can see the smallest one being ZU 2XX series and the largest one being of the name ZU 19 series. The Zinc MPSOC range includes uh, devices with considerably larger PL regions than the Zinc series and this makes MPSOC the better choice when extensive use needs to be made of the PL side for instance in hardware so acceleration of set of complex algorithms as part of embedded system design. So wherever the complex algorithms are there you would want to put it onto the PL and some of the hardware software partitioning which we are discussing right now is quite intuitive but uh, there are methods to quantify it as well which you will learn in the course. So there is almost you can see the 100 times increase almost 100 times increase from the smallest to largest here you can see there is a 10 time increase in the lookup tables and the maximum number of inputs output is also increasing by around uh, 4 or 5 times. So there is an overview of features and what all things are available in the um, Zinc MPSOC subfamily. So we have made three subfamilies CG, EG and EV devices and as you know the E devices in the APU there are four cores this is what the E stands for and in C there are two cores as compared to real time processing unit there are two cores in all of them. So the in Zinc MPSOC the APU is based on the ARM Cortex A53 architecture for running operating systems and software applications and there are either two or four cores. Then for the RPU they have chosen ARM Cortex R5 core for real time processing capabilities. They have chosen a dedicated graphic support and there is an availability of VCU. VCU is only available for the devices which are having the V suffix. Uh, so it is implemented as a hard IP in the PL. The VCU provides support for H.265 and H.264 video compression standard. So any video which is coming either in this format or it has to be relayed in this format. So it can do that compression very quickly. Then we have a configuration and security unit properly, pop, popularly called as CSU and a platform management unit, unit called popularly called as PMU. So it includes secure boot functionality, ARM trust zone support and voltage and temperature monitoring. And PMU is for platform uh, for managing power, security and functionality, uh, uh, functional system safety of the FPGA device. It is included in all the versions. Then most of the things which you will see here are actually broadly like available in most of these subfamilies. But still it's important to discuss these features and we'll again delve into these topics much more technically in the later uh, lectures. So there is an 256 KB of on-chip memory which is available in the PS itself for like you know storing the information and quickly processing on it so that you don't have to refer to your external memory again and again. Uh, along with interfaces for external memories which support several memory types. There is a direct memory access DMA controller as well and there are two DMA controllers one uh, in the full power domain and one in the low power domain and you will see basically the full power and low power how they are associated with the PS and the PL. Then there are certain high performance interfaces available in the PS like the PCI Gen 2, USB, SATA port, display port, gigabit ethernet port and there are certain integrated IP blocks available exclusively in PL like PCI express lane and this interlaken and ethernet map so all these are available uh, in different families. So of the uh, three like we have disc had a discussion about Zinc 7000 we had a discussion of basic discussion about Zinc MP saw but none of them would make sense to you until unless you have an understanding of an FPGA. 
So FPGAs are the longest established and the basis of the PL element of the zinc and zinc and piece of device. So what is an FPGA? So FPGA stands for field Pro programmable gate array. It is divided into two parts, the gate array part and the field programmable part. The gate array is like uh, the part of the acronym reflects that the FPGA device was originally composed of array of logic gates. But in strict sense, it's no more array of logic gates, but uh, something little more complicated, which we call as uh, lookup tables, LUTs. Ultimately, it's made of gate arrays only, but uh, they contain a selection of reconfigurable circuit elements. Uh, the field programmable reflects the FPGAs are programmable after manufacture, which is not the case with most of the things which you have manufactured. If the SOC of a TV is made, it will perform the functionality of a uh, television only. Or if it is the IC of a router, then it will perform the router capability only. If it is SOC of a, of a joystick controller, then it will do that functionality itself. So for most of the things we uh, choose a generic purpose, a general purpose computer and then write it with the software. But when like for many of these things like router, modem, telephone, you make ICs which are specifically meant to do that purpose. But with single FPGA, if you put in all these different things, a single FPGA, you can program it to work like anything, right? So it is field programmable. FPGA vendors such as Xilinx provide not only the physical devices, but also the development tools which, uh, with which uh, we develop and design the FPGAs and ultimately program them also. To aid productivity, there are also pre-verified cores which we call as IP cores, reference devices, documentation and so on and these IPs can be released by third party companies. Many of these IPs are in-house released by Xilinx itself to help us do different tasks, but you can buy any third party IP and it will perform and you can read the documentation of it. Like if there is an IP particularly meant to do, let's say, fast forward transform or there is an IP which is particularly meant for obstacle avoidance detection or detection of a fruit, of a rotten fruit in a bag of fruit. So you can do all these things with that IP. So originally, if you look at the, so this diagram we'll look in the next slide more clearly, but a small description of this diagram that uh, it began with like, you know, as low as 64 flip flops and having just three input lookup tables for implementing logic functions. The FPGAs have come a long way actually. So further, a number of specialist resources have been incorporated, including high speed memory and support for arithmetic clocking and connectivity. This is just the FPGA in itself. So focusing on the scale for the moment in this diagram, which you can see FPGA, uh, the diagram summarizes the expansion of FPGA in terms of logic cells, which are measure of logic density and slightly abstracted from low level elements to take account of different uh, differences between architectures. So the one of the um, dots which you see here is of FPGA, which I was referring to a few minutes earlier. The first FPGA, which is called Zinc XE2064, which is represented by tiny dot and was released somewhere around 1985. In recent years, it has just boomed and like, you know, the amount of resources you are able to fabricate in uh, an FPGA, it's, it's huge. So here you see that in 1985 Zinc XC2064 followed by in 2000's Vertex 2 and then the Vertex 4 series along with the Spartan series. So this Spartan is something which became very popular in academia as well and many of you might have already worked on Spartan FPGAs. Ultimately you just have to write your Verilog code, how it is going to deploy it into inside this that is the part which they abstract away from us but we will still look inside the hood that what is happening to get a better understanding. Then as you know, in the Vertex 7, Kintex 7 and Artex 7, uh, we had around the Zinc 7000 also got released in 2011. So they used this FPGA design. And then the final design they're calling as the Ultra Scale Plus design. So Kintex Ultra Scale Plus, Vertex Ultra Scale Plus. So red refers to the highest specification devices, green refers to the mid range and blue refers to the low range devices. 
So the basic architecture of FPGA has remained a two dimensional array of simple digital logic elements but they are grouped into CLBs so uh, each CLB comprises a small number of flip flops and lookup tables so this is the building block which we'll use CLB like we'll program a CLB together and in turn it is made up of flip flops and lookup tables where the LUTs are capable of implementing any boolean logic functions as well as small memories and shift registers so lookup tables are what actually do the magic inside an FPJ which what actually makes it reconfigurable and it's a very interesting thing how lookup tables actually work they pre-compute the truth table and then reverse like by pre-computing the truth table they match the input and the output the composition of CLB what is actually inc included inside a CLB what is the definition of CLB has evolved over time and uh, with one CLB in modern technology representing a greater amount of logic than in older devices. But CLBs are still connected together with what is called as the programmable interconnects and switch matrices and although improvements have been made to this connectivity infrastructure too. You can see an indication of all these CLBs in one of the figures which you see here that how uh, the lookup tables and uh, the flip flops have just increased. So it has increased by more than 10,000, 100,000 times the flip flops which you are seeing here, the lookup tables, the logic cells and the maximum number of input outputs that has also increased by almost 10, 12 times, 10, 20 times. The basic architecture of FPGA we are continuing, continuing. so FPGA, FPGA architecture has continued to evolve in a response to application requirements and uh, whatever your application requirement is the FPGA architecture just revolves around that so larger memory uh, blocks which uh, include the block RAMs and most more recently the ultra RAMs they provide dense high speed memory capabilities allowing for instance a significant amount of video data to be stored on the device while you're processing it and you can parallelize these things because you have more amount of memory available to store the frame of the video store the incoming frame to process in the next clock cycle etc and they dedicated multipliers uh, which were first of all introduced in 2000s but later on what we call it as dsp 48 x slices the x here simply denotes that there are multiple variations to it depending on family to family but primarily the purpose is to provide multiplication and addition subtraction other logical functions there is a support for high speed interfacing in the form of hardened ip blocks that is functional box physically implemented in silicon to the device which was integrated into selected FPGAs along with high speed serial interface blocks. FPGAs are practically like you know any device for that matter is practically useless if you don't allow it to interface with the outside world but uh, particularly in case of FPGAs you require very high speed interfacing and that too depends a lot on the application area. So for that we have high speed interfacing available and they are made using the high speed serial interface blocks. FPGA technology has found extensive use in communication infrastructure as you might see that the 5G deployment, the massive MIMO deployment, it is all powered by FPGA technology, data centers and high performance and cloud computing. These resources, the resources of FPGA are highly valuable. So you can see that in this uh, particular ultra scale plus FPGA VU13P the number of DSP48 slices is around 12k the block RAM memory capacity in total is around 94.5 MB the ultra RAM memory capacity is around 360 MB so 360 MB of data you can read almost like you know maybe half of it in just one single clock cycle so that is the amount of like you know the memory memory efficiency you have then there are certain high speed serial interfaces around 128 of them and for managing the clock we have the clock management tiles popularly known as CMTs so there are 16 CMTs and there are obviously the integrated hardened IP blocks which include the PCI express lane, the ethernet, interlinking and the system monitor. So just like the old FPGAs, modern FPGAs are also just two dimensional array of elements 
and this figure represents the indicative resource layout in the ultra scale plus FPGA. We right now just discussing the FPGA aspect of the things, not the PS. So at a high level of abstraction, the FPGA device layout comprises vertical regions. You can see that it's columnar architecture, it's vertically aligned, containing different type of resources. The majority of the device is allocated for general purpose logic, the CLBs, which composes primarily of the LUTs and the flip flops. Then along, like once you are doing all these uh, computations, where do you store all this data? So there are columns of block RAMs and ultra RAM memory blocks. And in order to do the arithmetic, there are DSP 48 slices available from uh, time to time. So you can see here the columns of DSP 48 slices, columns of block RAM and the column of ultra RAM, the clock management tiles which are managing the clock inside all this. And uh, so they are all available as thin vertical stripes in this diagram. If you zoom in into one of these configuration logic blocks which are available here, then you will see inside it that there is something which is called a switch matrix which enables the connectivity amongst different CLBs and uh, etc. And there are slices which do that uh, lookup tables and the lookup tables and which, which basically houses that. Along with that, there are a lot of input output pins which are pop pop popularly known as input output blocks which are arranged in banks and formed into columns within the main array of resources. And IOBs can support variety of interfacing standards. We will see so many interfacing standards like uh, SPI, I2C, UART, USB etc. I am just naming the CAN protocol is also one. So there are multiple interfacing standards which you can use. And additional connectivity is provided in the form of high speed serial transceivers which you can see here and which can read and write at very huge speeds. There are also additional resources present in the FPGA structure for configuration, clock management, system monitoring and that is not possible to show it in such a simplified diagram. One of the important resources which we will be using is the DSP slices. And they heavily rely on the fixed point multiplication which we have already covered in I think in the quantization lecture and additional arithmetic. So common DSP tasks which it can perform is like calculating the finite impulse response, F, uh, response FIR filtering or computation of the fast Fourier transform in any uh, project we might require all this and it will be able to do it very quickly. Uh, arithmetic operations of word lens but omitting some uh, so you can read this that uh, what it is doing this is a simplified block diagram which you are seeing here showing the arithmetic operations and word lens that what is the word length which is available in each of these blocks so uh, but omitting some of the supplementary features such as delay elements so not it's not the complete diagram uh, DSP slices can also be cascaded together without the requirement for fabric resources to be used in order to create like a bigger FIR filters or fast forward transforms and uh, where longer word lengths are needed then that is also available in the DSP slices that you can do a 98 bit 96 bit wide uh, adder circuit by combining two or more DSP slices. In general, no company will make a 96-bit uh, 96-bit adder circuit. But using FPJ, you can do actually in a single clock cycle this, uh, or maybe in very less clock cycles as compared to any other thing, a 96-bit wide adder operation. DSP slices are also used in barrel shifting, pattern detection, and other logical operations. Now let's come to the memory support. So uh, now we'll look at the memory support. So memories can be implemented on the FPGA uh, using the uh, CLB resources, which is typically uh, the preferred method of for storing small amounts of data. If there is a very small computation which you've done, you, you just use the CLB resource itself and that is called as the distributed memory DRAM. For larger memories, there are block RAMs capable of storing 36 KB or acting as two smaller 18 KB sections. And in ultra scale devices, you will see there is an inclusion of ultra RAMs which are with even greater storage capabilities of around 288 KB each. 
and larger memories can be created by combining block RAMs or ultra RAMs and then there is this off chips of memory off chip memory which is connected using the DDR4 and available in the board itself but the capacity to do that is there as well block RAMs and ultra RAMs are implemented as dedicated dedicated physical blocks on the FPGA itself so they are fabricated inside that as opposed to being constructed from general purpose low level logic elements and they are capable of high performance operation running at maximum clock frequency supported by the device. Ultra RAMs can also be powered down if not used by current configuration or put into sleep mode but not needed uh, by the operating design for an extended period. So this is how the memory capacity grows. It's uh, block RAM is about hundreds up to hundreds of KB. It um, stores about in ultra RAM. You can store about tens of MBs and of chip memory is obviously in hundreds of MBs like you know 512 MB or something like that. So now again let's look at the comparison between if after understanding all this overview and highlights let's again do the comparison between FPGA Zinc and Zinc MPSOC and with respect to their architectures, power consumption, performance and their features for embedded systems implementation so we'll look at certain of these things. So firstly the architecture. So in comparing the architecture of FPGA Zinc and Zinc FPSOC devices, we can summarize that the, there are three key differences that stand out. Zinc and Zinc MPSOC both provide a hard processor whereas FPGAs do not. The Zinc MPSOC's PS is larger, much more highly specified and more diverse than the Zinc's. The largest FPGA offer more PL than the largest Zinc and Zinc MPSOC devices. So if there is an application where you don't need a PS, then you just look for the FPGA and the largest FPGA is much 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 larger than what is available in the PL of your Zinc and Zinc MPSOC device. As we had seen earlier that Zinc was Xilinx's <coughs> first single uh, SOC device combining an APU with FPGA logic. The Zinc MPSOC uh, represents an evolution in Zinc that provides a wide range of processing resources for instance offers real-time processor, a graphic processor, as well as an application processor. On the other hand, Zinc has an application processor only. FPGAs do not include a hard processor, although one or more soft processors may be incorporated. So soft processor which Xilinx has created is called as MicroBlaze. And you can still use that. It, has, it comes with, with its own instruction set architecture. So all three devices, uh, device types include PL. The architecture of the PL has evolved over 30 years since FPGAs was first released with many different generations having been developed. On the other hand, Zinc and Zinc MPSOC feature, <coughs> feature regions of PL are particularly linked to a particular generation of FPGA logic. Like for Zinc 7000 we had seen it was either RTX 7, Kintex 7 or Vertex 7. So specifically the Zinc 7000 adopts uh, 7 series logic while Zinc MPSOC adopts the ultra scale plus logic and we had seen in that diagram if you remember. So these are number of differences exist in terms of CLB layout, DSP and memory facilities, connectivity. We will look at the, what are the DSPs uh, and the memory facilities, connectivity and clocking and power features which uh, differentiate these all these things. So you can see in this table, which is a quick resource comparison between FPGA, Zinc 7000 and Zinc MPSOC. You can see that in the processing system, all this is not applicable. APU is there in both. So it's a dual Cortex 32-bit ARM Cortex A9 processor. It is a 64-bit dual core or a quad core processor depending on the FPGA family. Then there's a real-time processor or 32-bit of ARM Cortex R5 processor and there's a graphics processor of ARM Mali series. In the programmable logic video processor you don't have anything here but here you have dedicated what is known as a video codec unit VCU as we call it popularly. The logic cells maximum number here you can see just exceeds far beyond like you know this available here and here but logic cells are there. The DSP slices maximum which you can incorporate that is also uh, there uh, mentioned in this. It's around 12K, this is around 3.5K, 2K. The memory types are here in this are distributed block RAM and ultra RAM. Here it's distributed and block RAM in the Sync 7000 series. 
and in the zinc episode again you have all these three things available so the total block ram and ultra ram is around 454 mb here it's up to 70.6 mb and for zinc semiconductor it was just 26 mb now let's have a highlight about the power consumption we'll deal about this very clearly later but uh, in order to understand that PL section of the SOC devices interfacing resources are comprised of general purpose input output and high speed serial trans transceivers which uh, complemented by hardened IP resources to support standards such as Ethernet and PCI Express. So FPGAs support a lot many things. The PS section of Zinc and Zinc MPSOC devices are for, uh, provide further standard interfaces like the CAN, I2C, USB, SPI as hardened resources. So the Zinc MPSOC includes some hardened interfaces not present on the Zinc. For instance, the interlaked interface is included as a hardened block and uh, this does a particular thing, this interlaked interface. Considerable progress has been made to reduce power consumption over the years at the same time as increasing performance. There was more than 1000 fold reduction in energy consumption between the introduction of Xilinx FPGAs in 1985 and the release of 7000 series in 2011. So there are majorly two sources, power sources, uh, sources of power consumption and the power consumption of programmable devices is naturally higher than fixed function equivalent ICs due to underlying architecture required to facilitate programming and holding the device configuration which basically means your switch matrix and your configuration logic block programming and execution. So there are two types of uh, power consumption, static power and dynamic power. So the static power comprises power required for the chip to operate in terms of holding its configuration. Static power occurs due to transistor leakage current that is current that passes through the transistor even when it is off and increases with the size of the device that is the number of transistor rises. Dynamic power, the additional power arising from operation of the design on the chip due to switching activity. So this is very important. It is frequency dependent. Example of flip flop will consume more power if toggling at 200 megahertz and at 100 megahertz. And dynamic power consumption can vary over time depending on the activity of the circuit elements. Whether you are running an EI model inside it or not, what is that? The rest stage. So engineers can influence dynamic power by optimizing their design for low power consumption. For instance, by ensuring the circuit elements are not clocked at higher rate than what it is actually required. <coughs> In the ultra scale and later uh, ultra scale plus FPJ series, <coughs> new architectural features have been reduced to reduce power consumption, such as improvements to the CLB architecture, which is the core of it, the DSP48 slices, and the memory structures, as well as uh, more area efficient interconnect. There are also device uh, options that can operate at low core voltages, which allow the designer to trade off power consumption against performance. And you'll have the option to choose either 1.8 volts or 3.3 volts or 5 volts. That option you can choose. Techniques such as clock gating, that is ensuring the new sections of devices are not actively working and consuming energy, also play a part in reducing power consumption. An intelligent clock gating feature was introduced in the Zincs uh, in the 7 series FPGAs and Zinc to apply clocking gates automatically without the need for designers to manually incorporate this into the system. As we had seen previously, the clock management tiles, CMT tiles, and how many of them were there? 16. So Xilinx design tools are updated regularly to exploit the architectural developments in new generations. And uh, Particularly in the Zinc MPSOC, we have a platform management unit which enables control over power domains and the various processing engines that comprise the PS. So now we have two things remaining, the performance and the embedded system implementation capabilities. So in terms of performance, you can see that uh, obviously uh, Zinc MP, uh, MPSOC um, Zinc MPSOC, we'll, we'll compare actually the clock, maximum clocking frequencies to compare the performance that how many clock cycles it can accommodate in the operation. That to, sorry, that to they do an operation, how many clock cycles it takes and depending on the frequency, it will be able to have a higher throughput or a lower throughput. <coughs> So the max which can go in MP sock is around 1.5 gigahertz in Zinc 7000. It is max 1 gigahertz and it's around 866, uh, 866 megahertz in the lower end. These are not defined for the ultra scale plus devices. 
<coughs> because there is no PS uh, available in the just the FPGA. As for the programmable logic, this can go to max of 891 MHz, same as the MPSOC, and this can go to max of 628 MHz and 741 MHz. So if you have to compare Zinc and Zinc MPSOC, power consumption per logic cell in the PL of Zinc MPSOC device is lower and overall performance is higher due to the various optimizations in the Ultra Scale Plus FPG architecture. In terms of PS, this Zinc MPSOC architecture is more complex, offering greater performance and also includes additional features for power management. So all in all, Zinc MPSOC has emerged out to be the best ones among the everything. Lastly, the embedded system implementation inside it. So the desire to implement uh, embedded system with the program with the programmable devices such as FPGAs has motivated the development of uh, devices such as Zinc and Zinc MPSOC. An embedded system, typically one or more process processors uh, along with memory, peripherals and interconnections together with connections to external memories and other components can be created using a single programmable device. With the processor in place, the system can support software applications usually running on top of an operating system and the programmable nature of the device has the usual benefits of field upgrades and runtime for re uh, reconfiguration and the parallel architecture of FPGA logic supports acceleration of suitable tasks. So it all in all, it's a very good package. On one hand on PS, you're able to run the uh, software and the operating system and uh, you're able to get all the field upgrades and usual benefits uh, of an FPGA of field programmable nature and runtime reconfiguration and doing the parallelism by using the FPGA part. Zinc and Zinc MPSOC processors have associated memories and interconnects between selected elements and this Zinc MPSOC uh, has more dedicated processing elements than which is there in the Zinc. For instance, a dedicated real-time processor has been introduced uh, which was not available in the Zinc series. FPGAs have supported embedded system design for some time, most notably through Microblaze as I called, told you that the, the name of the soft processor, Microblaze processor which is configured by the user as an IP core and constructed from the CLB resources on the FPGA. One of the distinct advantages of soft processors such as Microplace is their flexibility. These processors can be customized for the intended application. Example, floating point support can be omitted if it is not required, which reduces the PL resource nece uh, resources necessary to implement the processor in itself. The clear disadvantage is the performance. Hard processors offer much higher performance than soft processors can achieve. And to quantify the difference, Microplace processors can operate at up to 400 MHz in Ultra Scale Plus FPGAs. Whereas you can see in our uh, PS side, in the ARM processor, we could reach around 1 GHz and 866 MHz easily. And therefore, there is a much lower level of performance in the soft IPs. We can therefore conclude that SOCs are more optimal for embedded systems. They provide dedicated high performance processing resources and are capable of operating at significantly higher clocking, uh, clock frequencies than FPGA based soft processors. So the embedded system implementation in SS SOCs, both the Zinc and Zinc MPSOC is uh, much better than what is available in FPGA. So meanwhile, the opportunity still exists to use one of the more microplace uh, instances in the PL uh, section to supplement the primary processes in the PS. Even now, the soft processor of microplace can be used for assigning some task in the PL itself. With that, we'll conclude this uh, FPGA versus Zinc versus M Zinc MPSOC lecture. And in the next lecture, we look at the overview of the Zinc MPSOC architecture. Thank you so much.